I think Derrick Henry might still be running. Uh, maybe around 465. I, I, I really don't know. We're down 65 back to Nashville. Kevin Bowen back. Another edition of Kevin's Corner. That was um, that was ugly, and that might be a compliment. We'll get into all of that, what I didn't like, what I like, Twitter questions per usual um, on a Monday, November 30th. We're recording this kind of later on Monday morning. Uh, un- unfortunately, Chris Presley, a little bit of a COVID contact situation here, so um, – I guess, I, I don't know if we call him high risk or if we put him on the asymptomatic or wh- wh- wherever, but thoughts with Chris right now. Um, he should be back hopefully soon. So we've gone to the bullpen. We have brought in um, our resident Bears fan in the building. He is Mark Dykton, and uh, I believe he's sobered up from watching his Bears last night. <sighs> My God, that was ugly again. Thank You're welcome, America. You do not have to see the Bears in prime time the rest of 2020 unless some network is stupid enough to do that. Dude, I, I've literally said in this podcast, and I, I know you don't need me to pile on you anymore, but like, I don't know if there's a more boring NFL product than watching the Bears. You watch, you watch Red Zone, and then you watch the Bears game, and it's like you're watching modern-day football and 1920s football. <laughs> it's truly right. alarming yeah. how... Every yard looks like it's a struggle for them to get. I was going to say, yeah. Is the forward pass allowed uh, for for Bears games? Yeah. It is ugly um, for Mark Dykton's Bears. But in all seriousness, thank you. Oh, no problem. uh, Pleasure to be here. For doing this. Um, Hopefully it won't bore you too much over the next hour or so. Um, Like I said, and I guess we can just hop, hop right into it. You know, when I saw the Colts news piling up last week, you know, Buckner gets on the COVID list. You had the Jonathan Taylor weird situation, and I first heard about it kind of late Friday. I'm like, oh, boy, this doesn't sound great for his availability. And obviously missing Ryan Kelly and Bobby Okereke and and, and Autry. My expectation changed. I was surprised they were still a three-point favorite at at kickoff. I was like, wow, really? Um, I probably would have been more, much more of a pick'em game, but I still thought they'd be competitive. Uh, considering Tennessee is dealing with several key issues. So I guess those are my two kind of main takeaways. It's the fact that did I think you were going to handily win the football game? No. Did I expect you to get blown out of your own building and really not have one meaningful minute in the whole second half? Absolutely not, and that's inexcusable. But I can also sit here and acknowledge you had some major personnel losses, And I don't think what I saw yesterday totally shifts my thinking for how this team could look in the playoffs. But where it does shift my thinking is, shit, all of a sudden the playoffs, they might not happen. Like, now it's no guarantee. So I think that's the magnitude from yesterday's performance. It was awful. It was, again, inexcusable. But I can acknowledge the personnel losses and sit here and say, they've got to get really healthy to have a chance to make the postseason, and then in all likely, likelihood um, have to go on the road in round one. Well, we talked about this on the morning show and, and even leading up to this. Every game down this stretch is so crucial for the Colts to win, and with every loss, that mountain gets even higher to climb because they have a brutal stretch ending. You get Steelers, you got the Texans coming up. You I go mean, to Vegas. You got the Huge Vegas game. Raiders, which who knows what kind of team you're going to get with them every week. but. Right. They have a rough final five weeks. Yeah, and, and you know we, we talked about it on last week's podcast. Houston's not your typical four and seven team. No, and and you, you're going to see them twice in three um, in in three weeks. So man, it, it's really just the, the the margin for error has shrunk, and you know, kind of the house money potentially you could have in the month of January. Not to mention, and we talked about this a whole lot on Wednesday's podcast. Your playoff. Your your divisional chances now need a whole lot of help down the stretch. So um, it, it was the the loss is stinging in that sense. The sixty minute nature it's stinging in the fact that you're letting your biggest division rival right now do historical things against you. Most points given up in a half in franchise history at home with. Uh, with Tennessee scoring 35 yesterday in the first half, and then I think it was the most points Tennessee scored on the road in over a decade. Like, come on. Like, I get it. Notable personnel losses. But to that magnitude, to get your ass kicked like that, that's where um, I think you have, rightfully so, you have some frustration. And now here you are, clinging to that final wild card spot and, you know, the seventh seed, and, and you would go to Arrowhead 
to play Kansas City. So we'll get more into kind of the the two and two gauntlet on Wednesday's podcast, how the Colts have looked over these past um, four games, but um, we do have to focus on what we saw yesterday. All right, Kev, it's that time. What did you not like about yesterday's loss to the Titans? Yeah, let's let's start with the run defense. Um, you know, I, again, did I expect a regression from the Colts given the personnel losses? No Buckner, no Autry, no no um, Okariki. Certainly, did I expect eight freaking yards for Derrick Henry per carry in the first half? I mean, holy sh! It, it looked like what Center Grove High School was doing to teams <laughs> this season. I mean, it's just. It, it it allowed the Titans to stay in phase, and um, and yeah, you uh, you 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 let you let them dictate the game, and when you did that, you're gonna play with fire. And the Colts certainly play, it played with fire. I thought Henry just got to the second level virtually untouched so many times. I think some that stood out to me, Mark, from the game is like, okay, if Henry rushes for 178 on 27 carries. That's terrible, obviously. But, like, if he busts one for 60 in the fourth, or okay, maybe it's a little bit skewed. His long run yesterday was 31. Yeah. He didn't kill you with a long run, no, really, at no. all the entire game. It was just like, oh, 12 yards, oh, 14 yards, oh, 8 yards, oh, 10 yards. And it was just time in and time out. Uh, that, I think, is what is particularly frustrating of. It wasn't like what Baltimore had happened to them last week against Tennessee when Henry's kind of – two yards per carry really the first three quarters and then boom um he 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 hits you with the with the big one in fourth quarter or, or in overtime this was just simply a methodical beatdown and i think what is particularly frustrating to chris ballard is this is kind of one of his big core beliefs of like depth in the trenches d line's got to play in waves eight or nine guys O-line's got to have 10 offensive linemen you can turn to over the course of a season. And yesterday, I thought you were thoroughly outclassed with when your depth was needed. And again, you had more personnel losses in Tennessee, but Tennessee starting a third string left tackle who's 30 years old and he's never played in the NFL, never started in the NFL. And Jadavian Clowney's not in the lineup. And yet it's the magnitude of the issues. It is, again, historical type of rushing performance against you. you. I don't even think you touch Tannehill. I don't know. Maybe they count him running out of bounds as you touching them. Um, and from a Colt standpoint, you couldn't run it. And I thought Philip Rivers faced his most pressure of the year. So uh, very disappointed in the uh, in the run defense. Derrick Henry's performance, remind, it wasn't like one big gash. It was multiple gashes over 60 minutes where it was just like, okay, he's just going to keep shredding us for at least right. double digits every single time and it was they couldn't stop him they had no answer and it was just it was sad to watch but the Colts rushing defense has always been bad I feel like I've never seen a pretty stout Colts run defense we've we talked about on the show Maurice Jones Drew Arian Foster they seem to get gashed and uh Derrick Henry is the latest running back that just seems to have big performances against them game in, game out. Yeah, it, it, it's weird, Mark. You know, historically, and obviously you've you know, much more of a Bears fan, but you know full well that the history of the Colts, they aren't great stopping the run at all. Under Matt Eberflus, they've actually been good at it, besides Henry. I mean, yeah. literally, he is the one outlier in this. And, of course, Henry is just an outlier to begin with in his size and speed. But – the the fact that he continues to tear up the Colts, I think it's he has a second of all the teams in the NFL. Um, he his yards per carry, the Colts have allowed I think like the second highest to him in his career. Again, that's yards per carry, not obviously total rushing yards, which that can get skewed. But yeah, you know Tennessee's running it forty five times yesterday, and you have one tackle for loss, no playmaking from that unit, and even the healthy part in the back end, and we'll we'll get to Rocky scene here in a second, but even the back end. You know, it doesn't give you any sort of playmaking. So I know Tennessee's offense is is probably one of the better ones you're going to face this season. That's more of a, a reflection on your schedule. But they still entered Sunday, you know, 10th in total offense and I think ninth in points. It's not like crazy potent offense, but yet you're kind of, to me, it almost had the feel of varsity JV scrimmage. JV hangs in for a quarter and then the varsity's like, oh, yeah. Let's put them away now. Right. We need to show up and make sure that, you know, my girlfriend doesn't break up with me for the sophomore, you know, backup, whatever. Like, so, yeah, 
to that just, end, I'm just curious on your thoughts. If DeForest Buckner was playing, I mean, and they had a couple of those other guys that sat out, do you really think that Henry's performance would have been that diminished? Or do you think it was just one of those games where he wasn't going to be stopped? Diminished to a degree, but again, it was he's getting to the second level no matter where they're running the football. Right. Edge, interior, right side, left side. You know, okay, 8.2 yards. That was Henry in the first half. You put Buckner in there, I, I don't know, maybe it's down to six, something like I mean, Henry still had 100 yards in the first game, and he only carried it once in the final 14 minutes of the game. So even when you had Buckner, you had Autry in that first game, you had Okariki, Henry still gassed you. Right. It was just the score got not out of hand, but they got down two scores because Tennessee couldn't punt the football. So that that is, yeah, it, it would have helped you to the magnitude of, you know, whatever, four yards per carry. No, so uh, by far the worst run defense we've seen all season. And DeForest Buckner's all-pro candidacy just strengthens yes. even more. Uh, w- what did I put down there next? What do I have next? Offense without Costanzo. Yeah, you know, this is obviously a big topic that we talked about on the morning show, Mark. Um, and, and listeners of this podcast, oh, damn, Michael Penick's going to miss the rest of the season? Oh, boy, that's a bummer. Jeez. We, 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 we were talking about it on that, <laughs> that on the radio show. We thought yeah. it was kind of like a, a um, oh, shit, like, like I can't yeah. be hurt again, almost like a scared thing, like not – potentially an actual injury so that's boy that's awful there and that just knows. that's a dark cloud on a monday that, morning that, that, that is and i know there's some rigoberto um sanchez news that that is a whole lot bigger than football that we'll definitely get to let's let's say that till the end of the podcast and um and get through just kind of our game recap here but i'm um, going back to the casanzo thing mark he plays two series on sunday gets hurt on the qb sneak by jacoby Brissett. those two series 75 yard touchdown drive 66-yard touchdown drive. Colts offense is humming. You know, it's, it looks looks great. He leaves. You have seven straight empty possessions. Seven straight empty drives. I mean, this was, a again, Tennessee earlier in the season, you know, whatever, 17 days ago, you moved it inside their 30-yard line, inside the 10-yard line, routine, drive in, drive out, and it just goes to show you what Anthony Costanzo means to this football team. You guys have heard me talk about it endlessly. He's the most indispensable player on the Colts team, and it's frankly not even close. Uh, I would argue, and obviously I don't know the other 32 teams or 31 teams like I feel like I know the Colts. The drop from Anthony Costanzo to Raven Clark is steep. And it might be one of the steepest in the NFL from the starter Grand Canyon to backup. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's um, yeah, going off the uh, the high dive at Forest Park in Noblesville when I was younger. It's uh, it's just Tennessee, you know, trots out their third stringer at left tackle, and they're rushing for you know whatever six yards per carry, and Tannehill's hardly getting touched, and the Colts go to their backup, who's a former third round pick who started twenty some games in the NFL, and all of a sudden you look like that um you know i guess the the silver lining or the ray of sunlight a little bit is it doesn't appear that it's season ending necessarily for costanzo frank reich's phrase was we don't think it's worst case scenario um there's some reports out there about mcl that can vary in length you know with offensive linemen can you brace it up is it just a couple week thing but um yeah you know clark got whipped on the first three plays that 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 he was in there and I'm not shocked, you know. Yeah. Well, we talked about, I mean, even leading up to the season kicking off, we've talked about how much good fortune the Colts had with right. their offensive line, how healthy they'd been. And now you see when that health starts to deteriorate, how lack, how much lack of depth there is behind them. Preach. And just how that starting five is so good when they're together, but when with when they're getting glued together week to week, it's not a pretty picture. And I mean, you know, this is a Bears fan, and they've had to mix and match on their O-line this season, oh. and obviously tons of teams, Tennessee being one of them. Uh, this is normal. Like, yeah, okay, Ryan Kelly missing a game. That's nor- That's what every NFL team experiences, that. The Colts have been fortunate. That's the exact word to use with their offensive line health. And they, have frankly, with Chris Bauer's actions, they took it for granted. And it's shocking to me because Ballard is such a proponent of these trenches, and yet 
He loses Joe Haig. He loses Josh Andrews in the offseason, which I understand. Like, Chris Ballard couldn't have offered any amount of reasonable money to keep those guys. Those guys wanted to go compete for starting jobs elsewhere. But in the draft, in free agency, how do you not address, particularly tackle, in a more serious manner? Um, it's just absolutely devastating. And, um, yeah, I mean, the Colts, you know, we'll see if they're playing without Costanzo, you know, for a game or two or however, however long he's going to be out. The good news, I guess, is the Texans and Raiders situation. They don't get after the quarterback very effectively. You know, J.J. Watt, I'm sure, will be lined up a little bit more on the other side this week against Costanzo or against um, Clark or Chaz Green or whoever you start over there. But just a couple numbers. The Colts are 2-11. and Without Anthony Costanzo in the lineup, they've averaged 19 points per game in those 13 games. So uh, just reiterates how important um, he is. Very early look at the 2021 draft, but I think you can pencil in offensive line help <laughs> as a need for the Colts. Yeah, early, early too. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of hits, you know, for, for Chris Ballard, obviously in drafts, but not addressing tackle in a more serious manner. Now in two straight drafts, you know, even the year before, didn't take one till round seven, Jackson Barton. It was just head scratcher. Um, all right, what, what do we have last for things I didn't like? Rock Yassin. Mm, boy. Uh, you know, Mark, I always go back to rookie minicamp for Rock, and you heard me talk about this on the morning show. You know, first time being exposed to, you know, these, this coaching staff seeing these rookies in person. And right away the Colts are like, man, he's really handsy. He's really grabby. We've got to coach that out of them. Here we are at the end of year two, and I would still think you would say, he's really handsy. He's really grabby. And you play a position where if you're that, you're going to get targeted. You're going to get targeted by quarterbacks, and you're going to get targeted by officials. And that's exactly where, and honestly, I thought both the penalties were were fair penalties, but that's exactly where Rock is at right now. Uh, his mistakes yesterday, the three big plays, obviously, just all of them, were so critical. The A.J. Brown 69-yarder loses in man coverage, gets up inside release way too often. Hell, he committed a penalty there, too. It should have been illegal hands to the face. Boom, easy pitch and catch. You know, Kari Willis takes a terrible angle, and boom, 69-yard touchdown. And then the other two penalties came on the same drive when it was 14-all. You know, the, you know, everyone knows I'm a huge believer in game flow. It's 14-all, and... Rock gets called for the stop-and-go penalty on Corey Davis, and then the third and goal he gets called for the penalty on Corey Davis as well. And his just fundamental breakdown. And, and Rock's been pretty candid about this. It's not – he doesn't feel like it, he's too handsy. He feels like he breaks down with technique early in routes, or early in coverage, I should say. And to make up for it, he's got to use his hands. And that's where we're seeing – the flags. I thought he got off balance on the A.J. Brown jam on that touchdown, and when he gets off balance, now he's trying to grab. He kind of stabs at him, and he's falling backwards and just and just loses it. So um, I know we got a lot of Twitter questions about it, so we can wait maybe till then. But you know, I I, I think you gotta you gotta look at benching him. And, and, and the tough thing is like Xavier Rhodes was kind of in and out a little bit yesterday. You need Xavier Rhodes to play every snap because your cornerback depth outside is getting tested right now. And you know, Rock had to play a little bit there after he got burned. And, um, yeah, he got exposed there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We went over what you didn't like, Kev. What did you take away that you liked from the Colts' loss to the Titans yesterday? Man, I only got one, uh, and that's T.Y. Hilton. And it was kind of the backdoor way into your old uh, whatever nearly 100-yard day and touchdown. But at this point with T.Y. Hilton, we will take anything. He, um, what do you have? Zero targets in the first half, Mark. And then for those of you that play in a 35-league fantasy league and start a 35-team fantasy league and start at T.Y. Hilton, four catches for 81 yards and a touchdown in the second half on five targets. Simply... You just have to get him going. For as good as Michael Pittman has been recently, he looked like a rookie on Sunday and had some drops and just some timing stuff and whatnot. But um, it's uh, 
for this team to make a January push slash January run, you need the Hilton you saw in the second half. And honestly, I thought if Rivers let him in the deep ball, he probably scores there. But I thought he made a couple nice sideline grabs. And um, yeah, it's it it's it's my only individual bright spot. Sure, Jacoby was set in short yardage, decent. I don't I don't even know where else that I would point to for yeah. that. So T. Y. Hilton's drop off in 2020 has been probably the most alarming thing I've seen this season from a guy who's been so consistent throughout his career. Right. You add Philip Rivers to the mix, you're like, all right, we're going to see T. Y. Hilton probably put up career numbers. And it's been the exact opposite of that, where you're like, is he done? That's what it's getting to at this point, where you get a performance like this, but it took 12 weeks to finally get him going. It's been an alarming drop-off in 2020. And again, Mark, it's in a contract year, yeah. Which and he's been healthy. You know, it's, he hasn't battled like a ton of injuries like he did last season either. So, um, man, just... You hope if there's one small, small, small bright spot from yesterday, is it him? And now he goes and faces the team he's torn up in Houston, but still has just not the same connection with Rivers and nowhere near the same sort of production that, you know, he had with Andrew Luck. And that was something that we debated on this podcast. Without Andrew Luck, and again, the quarterbacks haven't been great by any means, Brissett and Tolzien and, you know, Clipboard Jesus and whoever else started. They haven't been Pro Bowl number one wideout production. Yesterday was a step in getting back to that, and it's neat because if you can get him and Pittman going, you know maybe that can help you out. Trey Burton continues to be a nice weapon, especially in the red zone and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, that's literally that's the only bright spot. I thought about not even saying anything that I liked, but T. Y. Hilton backdoored his way into uh, into some nice fantasy points, or for those that bet on him, took the over. Like you said, he's in a contract year. What do you think happens to T. Y. Hilton in the off season? Yeah, you know, I, I I am one of the few probably that still would look at bringing him back with the clear caveat of pay cut and legitimate pay cut. I just don't want to put that much pressure on Michael Pittman and Paris Campbell to all of a sudden carry that torch. It's a much more of a, uh, you know, you don't have one person carry it for 25 miles of the marathon sort of thing, but... Yeah, I, I'm not slamming it shut, shut. I, I don't think it's all on Hilton, but at $15 million a year or whatever the hell he's making, no way. And if he doesn't agree to that pay cut, that depth at wide receiver looks even more concerning because that's a lot of young guys with not much game situation. No, and, and we'll see what happens with your guy, Allen Robinson, and, and you know some of the Kenny Galladay and Juju Smith-Schuster, some of these other wideouts in the open market. But then you run into like what you were asking earlier about the draft. It's like left tackle so high on the draft list. Okay, is receiver going to be high again for a third straight year? What about quarterback? You know, the the whole long-term quarterback debate. So um, that's it, man, though. That's, that's, that's what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, like I said, there's it, – it, it's much more of, to me – yesterday's loss is stinging playoff chance home field division wise not as much as what I think this team can do in the month of January but to do that stuff you got to get healthy because your depth really really got exposed yesterday yep yeah you say let's let's hop into Twitter questions Kev and first one's from Scotty all right all right, Kev, time for quit. Okay, let's start that over. All right, Kev, time for Twitter questions. We're going to go to Scotty right out of the gate. Let's do it. I thought going into this one, the Colts probably weren't going to win. The team played like they definitely weren't going to win this one. Do you think the injuries on this scale affect the mindset of the team and its will to win? Meaning, do they just give up for the most part? Do you think they would have had the will to win without the injuries? I just feel like it was a piss-poor effort. Well, I definitely agree on the piss poor effort, but I, I don't think it's a giving up sort of thing. I mean, hell, if if we're looking for positives, uh, the Colts won the second half, I think. <laughs> well, there's that. Twelve to ten. There you go. I don't know. Hey, maybe ha- hang a banner for that. Um, yeah, I I don't. <laughs> they have really struggled out of the gate, which is worrisome. I think that falls more on coaching, and I I do think Frank Frank I combined Frank Reich's first and last name and just went with Frank. Um. I do think Frank Reich does a pretty good job in handling this team on a week-to-week basis, and his background as a backup quarterback doesn't allow them to feel sorry for themselves. But still, it's uh, it's quite alarming, man, where you got into the game and it's 14-all, 
and then you wilt, and it's like literally Costanzo injury, game's over. Like that's that's what happened. I'd say one play mark that stands out to me from yesterday where this is a coaching on down situation. The Titans are going to punt it away at 28-14 with like 40 seconds to go in the first half. Mike Vrabel decides to take a timeout after sending the punt unit out there. He's taking kill shot. Colts put their defense back out there. Xavier Rhodes with, I don't know, 20 to go on the play clock, helmet off, yelling at A.J. Brown. Darius Leonard has to hold him back. Just looking like a child out there on the biggest play of the game. I mean, that is a stop situation. You could score there. Got 30, 40 seconds to go. If you can get it to 28-17, now you feel like you've got some mo on your side and like you did against Tennessee two weeks ago or even Green Bay, you've shown you can play well in second halves. And then Tyquan Lewis, he's not even supposed to be out on the field. He's running off the field at the last second. You're chaotic. Your head's not in the game defensively. Tannehill hits you with the big ball to Corey Davis, and now you're down 35-14 and a half, and the game's over. Yeah, that was, I mean, lack of discipline. Xavier Rhodes reverted to Vikings Xavier oh, Rhodes man, then. Was, I yeah. didn't know what the that hell was, was going Ebron, on. That was Eric Ebron, Lions, and Xavier Rhodes, Vikings on the field at once. And, and like, the discipline. Six first-half penalties, That's that's just... Kills yeah. you. Absolutely kills you. Matt Adams, I don't know what he was doing. All right. Alex wants to know, losing Costanzo really hurt us, and Clark just can't hold his own. Do you think we should shift the line around with Nelson or Braden Smith being moved to left tackle or even Chaz Green getting a shot? What other ideas do you have? Clark is too much of a liability. You can tell how rushed Rivers feels. Oh boy, man, you you are right on the rush part. I don't know if um the 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 pure numbers will do it justice, Mark, like sack and hurries, but you know, Phillip Rivers in the pocket is like you know, when my wife sees like a bug in our house, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of, you know, it's just kind of like a little bit fidgety. And, uh, you know, Nelson has never played tackle, definitely didn't do it at Notre Dame. Hell, Braden Smith played two games of tackle, period, at Auburn. And that was on the right side. So I, I know like that might sound easy and be like, oh, well, Zach Martin did it in Dallas. Well, Zach Martin played tackle in, in, in college. So I don't think it's that easy. And, um, I think it's got to be Clark, or uh, honestly, it's got to be Green, in my opinion, and, and you have to help him. And that's what kills you, really, is like, this is not just a, it creates more pressure on Rivers. No, no, no. You have to help, which then takes away a skill player for an offense that is not very dynamic with tons of passing game skill talent. And I thought yesterday showed it, you know, Rivers was uh, barely over 50%. Uh, you guys have heard me talk about those next gen stats. He was negative eight in expected completion percentage. So basically, like if you just freeze the play, throw it, his expected completion percentage was minus eight compared to what it should have been. And I think that that has to be close to a season low. And I think some of that is naturally from pressure and just not feeling totally confident back there and all those things. So look, this is not an ideal situation, but. And this sounds blunt, but it needs to be said. This is the bed the Colts have made for themselves. Yep. Flat out. This is how they handled the offseason. It's why this is my biggest issue all offseason. And you can't be going moving Nelson to left tackle because then you're just Dr. Frankensteining this offensive line that's already hurt with injuries. And then you're just throwing guys in positions they're not familiar with. And right. that could be a whole other is li- yes. litany of issues going forward. Yeah, you, you don't need to create some domino thing. You know, it's just... You're going to have to help out that left tackle. And, and, I mean, Nelson doesn't look healthy to me, honestly. No, you know, it, no. it's this is not something where you just throw him over at left tackle and, and pray. I have a very good I Like, I'm I'm pretty confident by the end of the season we'll hear that he's getting off-season surgery yeah. of some kind. No, I, I think that's a good point. All right, Big Bama. Is it fair to say that out of all the starters, Rock is the weakest link? Weakest link? Wait, that's – I'm sorry, that's worded weird. Yeah, I'm sorry. The, the, these – these guys struggle with okay big bama wants to know is it fair to say that out of the starters rock is the weakest link it's obvious quarterbacks target him because of his reputation for being grabby on coverage i know ballard likes his wrestling background but it can work against him when he gets beat because his instincts may tell him to grab instead of trusting his technique more am i wrong for thinking this way yeah, I mean, out of all the starters, he might be the weakest, honestly. I also think we need to acknowledge the position he plays allows for us to really see his deficiencies a lot more than other spots. You know, I, I don't love what the Colts have at wideout either. But, yeah, I would probably say right now he's played like that. The whole kind of wrestling background, it's, you know, it, 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 
when I think wrestling background, I think of trenches, linebackers, safeties, maybe not necessarily corners because, you know, the hand fighting can be such a different tone from what you had. And he was a two-time state champion in Georgia. And, and you guys have heard me say this before. I also just worry about a little bit the level of competition he played in college. And he went to Presbyterian for three years. Like, when I hear Presbyterian, I think of, oh, I, I've had three weddings there. Or I don't know, like some church that I'm supposed to go to for like a buddy's wedding. I don't think of like, oh, that's a college football program. And then went to Temple's final year, which, you know, certainly is a step up in competition. But it's not at that level. And I think now you're demanding more from him on a snap-in, snap-out basis. He could get away with technique issues at Presbyterian or Temple. You can't do that in the NFL. You're going to get exposed. And, you know, A.J. Brown and Corey Davis have some talent, certainly. But still, uh, right now, big, big bam, I would agree with you there. Yep. Referees are looking for a reason to throw the yellow flag and <laughs> grabbing at wide receivers. That'll get it thrown every single yes. time. Yep, yep, yep. All right, Primus is up next. That Jacksonville loss is coming back to haunt us like a bad one night stand. <laughs> oh gosh! That's, Amen, brother. I was gonna say it sounds like Mark Mark Dyke did from earlier in the show. <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, it is. Oh, boy, gosh, doesn't it feel like that? Um, you know, when you <laughs> when you look at it, but it divisional. Conference losses. You can't have that. Like, th- those are the losses that come back to bite you. And I said it last Wednesday. I'll say it again. For the Colts to miss the playoffs, the, really the only way I could see it happening is losing to Tennessee and the Raiders. Well, you're halfway there. You already lost to Tennessee, and now who knows what the Raiders will look like in a week. But your longest road trip of the uh, of the season is going to be huge because your tiebreakers are just not in your um, in your favor. Jaguars could be stepping into the week 17 against the Colts 2 and 14 maybe. They got the Vikings, if that, right? The Titans, the Ravens, the Bears, that's where that second win might come from. And then the Colts. So you could be one of their two wins or maybe their only win heading into week 17. Th- that and again, this sounds absurd and I don't think it'll happen. But in the owner's eyes, that's fireable. Yeah. That that those are fireable offenses, and we're a long way away from getting to week seventeen and all of that. But if all of a sudden you have something to play for, postseason wise, and you were, for some reason would lose that game, pray let's for, just let's pray, just say pray, the Titans lose, and the division is on the line heading into week seventeen. How confident do you feel that that Colts team can step up against the Jaguars? I mean, they have a track record now that says they play down to the Jaguars yeah. level. They've been better at home against the Jaguars, but still, like you said, there is that track record. And, and if the Colts lose that, I mean, it's, you know, pray for Jim Irsay's butler, <laughs> n- mailman. Uh, yeah, I mean, everybody. All right, Hunter. First off, what a bad loss by the Colts, but I guess one positive that may, is that maybe T.Y. is getting going finally. Also, is there anything you saw that went away from – also, is there anything you saw that we went away from – after 14-14, I feel like we were in the game, and then it seemed like we were just left the game get away from us. Yeah, I, I think it's a Casanzo injury, you know, in all seriousness. The offense just cannot sustain things. Even at full health, I sometimes have questions of that. And definitely, I have questions, um, you know, when you're losing your most indispensable player. I mean, because let's be honest, the defense wasn't going to stop. I mean, they weren't. You know, you hope Derrick Henry has an equipment issue. That was probably the only way he wasn't, you know, going to run all over you. All right, we've already touched on this a couple times, but we'll go back to it. Mitch wants to know, true or false, the entire game changed when Anthony Costanzo went out. Offensively true. Again, you had still given up 14 points defensively, but offensively it was true. And then the trickle down is you're letting Tennessee stay in face. And you do that, you're going to face the best rushing attack in the NFL, and you're going to face it a whole lot. Jason wants to know, didn't think I'd be writing this with five games to go, but if the Colts are mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, do you really realistically see them going to Eason as the starter to see what they have? $40 million quarterback salary on the bench. Probably would be some variation of this question a hundred times this week. (laughs) Well, Jason, actually, I think you're the only one. Um, First off, let me say this. For the Colts to be mathematically eliminated, I even think if they lost their next three mark, they would still be still have a chance going into week 16 because remember you have the extra playoff spot this year and the Colts have seven wins. Like you would, 
I mean, unless Baltimore and Miami all of a sudden start winning a bunch, like, and who knows where Baltimore's situation is, like, I, I, I don't think they would be math, mathematically eliminated before week 16 and probably more like week 17. So, yeah, I don't. Ravens currently, Colts are currently the seventh seed. Ravens sit at the eighth seed at six and four. Raiders, six and five. Patriots, five and six. So, even at 10, I mean, there's a team under 500. So. Right. Right, I mean, right, it's yeah. it's it, they'd have to really drop off to fall out of the playoff picture. So to get to your question, I don't think uh, they will be mathematically eliminated that early. And secondly, I, I don't think they would turn to Easton. I don't. I would, but, I mean, they dressed Brian Hoyer for two meaningless games last year. Brian Hoyer for two me- – 34-year-old Brian Hoyer instead of Chad Kelly. So, you know, I don't – I don't know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe things would change there. All right, David, you probably are getting a lot of Clark questions. What do you think we, why do you think we've kept him on the team since 2016? It's been the same story of him struggling, and then there seems to be no accountability about his play. Hey, David, I think it's a very fair statement. I would say one thing that Chris Ballard and Ryan Grigson align on, um, in some capacity, Ballard is much more about it than Grigson, but they both are enamored with physical traits. Again, Ballard more so than Grigson, but I think they're obsessed with the um, wingspan of LaRaven Clark, and they feel like with coaching, that's uh, you know a, a ball of clay you can mold. Uh, clearly, that has not happened. Um, you know, to some degree, it's hard to find tackles. So I get it. You want a lot of tackles in your building. So I didn't have an issue with them re-signing LaRaven Clark back in March, but it was with the caveat of get some competition in there. If you if, if all it's about creating competition, this and that, you've totally gone against that. The Colts, I will reiterate what I said in the offseason. The Colts entered training camp this year with their five starters back. Not a single reserve offensive lineman. I don't know. There was 10 of them, 12 of them in camp. Played an offensive snap in the NFL last year. Mm. Not one. Like, huh? I mean, that was just mind-boggling to me. It's one so. of those things where you see it from the outside, and you're like, if I can see it, why can't you? Right. Why did you know. not th- see that as possibly being a major issue heading Especially into a season? Especially because Chris Bauer believes in it so much because he says all of this. This is not like Grigson did not believe in investing a lot into the O-line right away because he's like, oh, no, I've been a part of championship teams that have had undrafted you know, free agents in the interior of their O-line and at center and whatnot. But Ballard's like, oh, shit, I got to get this figured out. We got to invest a whole lot. So that's where it's even more confusing yeah. to me, Mark. All right. Joe says, I guess my qu- Twitter question is, what are y- your three biggest needs? Mine are cornerback, quarterback, and wide receiver. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to get left tackle in there, man. Yeah. Um, I, I would still put quarterback atop it just because I believe in it so much for the long term. Uh, but I'd probably put tackle and wide out. You know, corner, it would be right there as well. If you give me a 3A, I don't know. You pray that Marvell Tell comes back from the COVID opt out and gives you something. But yeah, those are the four. I'm going to try to do this one justice because I'm going to try to do it how I figure Logan wrote it. <laughs> Put both of Rocky Scene's hands in clubs? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. Maybe he needs to be taped up like Nate Robinson, but I, I don't know if that, that went well either for old uh, old Nate. Um, dude, have a Matthew Adams fighting, fighting whatever. I mean, he got again. Rock got lucky. AJ Brown, the hands to the face wasn't flagged, and I know that looked like Roger Saffold false started on that play, which I'm not allowed to talk about officiating because I said I wasn't allowed to, but I had to throw that in there. All right, IU fan in Texas wants to know: Is a wild card playoff team the best we can expect given the team we have? Maybe one playoff win. Seems like best will end up with lack of running game is biggest disappointment to this fan to date. What say you? Yeah, to me it is. I would I'd kind of put the O line with that, but yeah. I uh, and we'll get more into this on Wednesday, but to win multiple playoff games, you have to have home field, in my opinion. And and there's no way I can sit here right now this team is going to Heinz Field or Arrowhead and winning a playoff no. game. No way. Uh, the run game was again awful yesterday, and certainly when you're you know when you're missing Kelly and Costanzo for three quarters, I expect it to be bad. But it kind of goes back to you know something we talked about earlier in the year of 
a lot has to be really, really good in the health department for the Colts to be considered in those top tiers. And they have been healthy in the trenches really up to this week. And when you start to have normal stuff, that's when I think you become much more of a middle-of-the-pack AFC team. Greg. Hey, Kevin, love the podcast. Answering fan questions is my favorite part of the show. I made a Twitter account just so I could get in on the fun. My question would be, Hooker and Mack are in contract years. It sucks their seasons have ended with injury early. Do you think the Colts bring them both back on a short-term deal, or do you think Ballard lets them try out free agency? Yeah, I, I say yes on Marlon Mack, Greg. Um, and first off, thanks for creating a Twitter account. Um, you might regret that decision based off <laughs> how, how Twitter can be at sometimes, but welcome. Um, I absolutely love it. Malik Hooker, I still think no. I just think that that's a marriage that, that needs to end. I mean, it's not like... Eric Ebron bad by any means, but I just think it needs to kind of end. But Marlon Mack, I'm definitely giving him another shot. You know, nothing crazy. I don't know, three, four million, something like that. Mike wants to know, just listen to last Wednesday's podcast. A question was asked if you think the Colts should re-sign Rivers and draft a QB. You said yes. Wondering what do the Colts think of Eason and where does he fit into their plans? Yes, I did say yes. Um, And I will reiterate, it's – you know, very difficult to hit on that drafted quarterback, but you have to keep on trying. And so I don't think that this is necessarily an indictment of Eason. Eason was the 122, yeah, 122nd overall pick. No team is drafting a guy 122 overall and saying, you are a franchise quarterback no. without ever seeing him in the preseason, <laughs> let alone like regular season right. rapes. So, I mean, honestly, last week when Rivers missed the Wednesday practice, that might have been the first time Eason has taken scout team snaps all year. I mean, Frank said that it was very, you know, kind of limited in, in in what Eason was was doing. So, and, and I also think, what about Eason as a backup moving forward? I mean, that'd be fine. I don't need to remind you, you know, what quarterback depth means to a franchise or whatnot. So, uh, yeah, I, I I don't think I think they look at Eason as a potential potential project even though there was no preseason i think the denver broncos would have taken a flyer on jacob eason yesterday yes they would i mean some of those stories were unbelievable trying to sign their coach (laughs) i thought i thought i was reading an onion article when i read that one that was literally like it's kind of stuff you dream about like oh blue you're in section 232 and who are you with you're gonna play quarterback for us today i mean jim john elway's in the in the (laughs) Owner's box. Just go up there and knock on his right. door. Is Peyton healthy after the golf match on yeah. Friday? Could he? Could he? Could he play there? JJ, who will get more? Hopefully, more than one primetime games next season: the Colts or the Browns? Oh, I I, I would assume the Browns. I mean, Baker and Odell in primetime is yeah. better than aging Philip Rivers and aging. The Colts um, will always get that random AFC South Thursday night game. Right. That's but outside it. of that, who knows? I think the Colts play the AFC East and the NFC West next year. AFC East, that's not very, I don't know, the Colts, Patriots. Does that ring a bell nationally? I don't think as much as it used to. NFC West, obviously. You know, some nice matchups there. but I still think the Colts get one before the end of the season tonight. I think Colts-Steelers is going to get flexed. Flex? Yep. The Sunday I- nighter that week is Tennessee-Green Bay. Is it? I thought yeah. it was. Are you positive? Because I thought it was Chiefs and. Pretty sure. Let me let me uh, let me look that up. But, um, yeah, because that's that's a game that yeah. I mean, you can definitely make a strong case for, especially if Pittsburgh's undefeated, and if the Colts are still playing for a for a playoff spot. I thought it was Tennessee Green Bay. I don't know. Maybe maybe I was wrong on that. I'm looking at Bills Patriots. Is the Oh, week- nope, nope. I apologize. That was Monday night. You're right. Titans Packers is Sunday night football as scheduled. Bills Patriots is that Monday night game. We got well. You know, if, if Pittsburgh's undefeated, they could they they would probably flex that. I, I know there's some rule on like being flexed too many times, or I don't know. I think it's five. Hell, we don't know that as Colts fans because the Colts are never in prime time. But they were with Peyton a lot. Only um, two four four o'clock games that week, so I could see that at least getting flexed to the later yeah, window. That's a good point. Yeah, because they're one o'clock right now. Yeah, so we'll see. Jay. I just can't believe the Browns are eight and three. That that is probably the most under the radar eight and three right. I can recall in like, a while. I like woke up this morning. I'm like, wait, what? Got to be a misprint. Casey, who has the higher ceiling, Chase Claypool or Michael Pittman Jr. Higher ceiling is Claypool. Yeah, I mean, he's just got some incredible athletic gifts, and I I, I think I said that throughout the draft process. You guys know what I think of Claypool. 
Um, he is molded out of clay and the ideal clay you would want in terms. And I guess that that's a very big pun that I'm not trying to make there. But yeah, I mean, he's a freak, freak athlete. Pittman, I think it's more consistency, you know, a little bit of a higher floor, you know, not as much of the volatility. You know, like Chase Claypool is like running down punts. It's just like he's kind of got a bit of a gadgety feel to him. But yeah, oh yeah, it's definitely Claypool. But I I don't want that to seem like I think Pittman is not potentially a very good wideout in the NFL. Right. It's just when you're talking higher ceiling. Yeah, Chase Claypool looks like he could be a legit number one in a couple of years. Yeah, I mean, he's got some freakish, freakish traits that, uh, I mean, this guy played high school football in Canada. Mm-hmm. And that contributes uh, as well. He's And really, he didn't emerge at Notre Dame until later in his career. So there, there is some, some rawness. Michael, longtime listener from Northwest Indiana. Did Sunday just bring back those hopeful luck Sundays back in 2012, 2015, or was it just me? Love the pod, and I hope we beat Tennessee. Obviously, this was before the game. Yeah, this was. Um, thanks for recognizing that, Mark. Yeah, Michael, I don't. I really think to get the full long. Yeah, the Green Bay win was awesome, but I, I don't know. Maybe I'm misspeaking, but I feel like for the fan base to really be like, all in, all in. Here we go, week in, week out. You have to have the young QB to rally around. I think it's tough. I just think Rivers has a stigma of this fan base and his age. It just doesn't lend towards maybe that nathan is the competition message from ballard not applicable to the o-line this year since it's so obvious that clark and Chaz are far from starting linemen have the guys gotten complacent Boy, it's certainly in- your mic's off oh sorry about that no, <laughs> now my mic is on um it's certainly an interesting point um and, and i go back to what i said earlier i'm surprised because it means so much to him you know it'd be one thing if he wasn't really all in on this philosophically, but he is. Chase, given the struggles this season in Philly, should they move on from Peterson and Wentz? Would you be interested? He's almost 28 and hasn't been good since the injury, but more importantly, since Reich was his coordinator, so maybe they can recapture some of that early 2017 magic. Would you give up anything in a trade for that contract or willing to commit any money if he's released? P.S. It's been two plus weeks and I'm still not over the Marcus Peters interception call. (laughs) Yeah, gosh, I kind of forgot about that. It's crazy how the NFL season makes you forget about yeah. those plays. Um, you know, Chase, it, it, it's a really good question. I would say, Mark, of these quarterbacks that are on the open market next year, or potentially on the open market, Wentz is probably the most intriguing to me for the Colts. I still don't love it, but of the Darnold, Dak, I forget. Who Trubisky. Is, Trubisky. <laughs> Trubisky. Um, Don't get on that merry-go-round. I had a buddy of mine. I'll just out his name here on the podcast because it was such an outrageous comment. Holton Witcher texted me last night, um, you know, about a half hour before kickoff. We're we're looking to make a wager on the Sunday night game. I have a feeling that Mitch is going to do is going to play well tonight. I would like to smack that guy because that if you've watched any Bears football the last three plus seasons, you know that regardless of who's under center, it wasn't going to be pretty. And no, that, I mean, he, he he's more mobile than Foles, but he, you could see he's just overthrowing guys, throwing interceptions. It was, it's time to go. We get a quarter into it and I, and I respond back to my group. Oh, wow. Uh, Mitch looks pretty good. And, and then my friend, Brian Shelburne also responds. Yeah. Holton, what did you, what, where was this feeling coming from? What, what, what was the hunch? You know, did you hear that Mitch had a good week of quarantining in Chicago? What was the real good Thanksgiving brunch at the Trubisky apartment in uh, Lake Forest or wherever he lives? I, yeah. So to get back to the question, Chase, went somewhat intriguing. What would I commit? I have no idea what it would take. I, I wouldn't love to commit a whole lot of money on a second contract or on another contract, I should say. I don't know. I really want to try to solve it in the draft, but maybe a third-ish rounder. Yeah, that's a lot of money tied up to your uh, quarterback room then. But Rivers and Bursette are off the books. Right. You know, both of them are coming off the books. So, yeah, it is, but the Reich-Wentz relationship, man, you worry about his health. I don't know. I let me watch Monday Night Football tonight, and I'll make my decision off that. Okay, we well, can get the 2017 Reich, Wentz, and Trey Burton train going <laughs> right, again exactly. in full, full yeah. effect. It's Philly special your way down the field. There you go, Drew. With the Hall of Fame semifinalists announced, what are the odds Peyton and Reggie are inducted in the same year? Boy, Drew, it's a it's a great question. As I don't turn off my mic for the 13th or turn it on for the 13th time this pod, I'll say 52. Uh, percent Okay. 
you know, Edge is going in in 2020. To me, it's it comes down to Calvin Johnson and Reggie Wayne this year. And I am a firm believer, Mark, that if I'm, you know, looking at individual seasons, you're picking Calvin Johnson. But to me, longevity, when you're talking Hall of Fame, means something. And you've got to sustain some sort of longevity to be a uh, first ballot Hall of Fame. I think Calvin Johnson will go in and, yeah. and should go in. But to be a first ballot, to me, you've got to sustain your career because it's so difficult to do that in the NFL. Um, so I, I I think Reggie has a chance to get in this year. Peyton, Charles Woodson. Uh, I forget who else, but those are kind of the big, big ones. I think Reggie gets in, but I think he not this year. Yeah, that, and that's fair. I mean, Marvin waited three years. I mean, Reggie's postseason resume is really what stands out to him. Dad Talks, which sounds like a podcast, <laughs> wants to know the Colts are looking very good. I, again, think this is before Sunday. If they make the playoffs and make decent a decent deep run, does Phillip Rivers get re-signed? Do you think we should still take a quarterback in round one of the 2021 draft next year? Question for the pod. Dad Talks, is that a podcast we should start? I or? think so. Yeah. As a father of two girls, um, you've certainly given me some, some, some well, great about advice. About to be three, my God. And that, yeah. Um, pray for you. Uh, you know, and again, we obviously saw what happened Sunday. I, I, I still think the Colts want to re-sign him. I do. Um, you know, a lot can change, obviously, in the final five games, and we'll see what not. But, yes, my – Dad talks the Colts could honestly win their last five games, make a run to the AFC title game, and I would still think they should draft a quarterback in round one. Like yeah. he's thirty eight years old. I mean, it's and not under contract for next year. I mean, I firmly believe Philip Rivers still wants to play football, but like what if he's like, Yeah, nine kids, quarantine life, this is kind of crazy. I just want to go. We got a transfer into the high school football program that I'm coaching. <laughs> Let's go down and, and start that. Like, I don't know, crazy hell, we've seen crazy retirements here. And we know he's not mobile, so you know, even though he has that streak of starts going, I mean, eventually you're gonna get hit and <laughs> Right. I mean, you might not get back up, and then you got Jacob Eason sitting in the wings and Jacoby Brissett, which neither of those seem like viable options going forward. So No, no, no. I nope. think you should draft a quarterback every draft and just go from there. Yeah, sound like a Bears fan. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> All right, last one. Tyler says, with Eberflus getting more and more possible head coach attention as the defense shines and the Colts having all-pro talent at all three levels of the defense – is the defense success due to the talent or Eberflus' scheme? And can you expect defensive success should he leave? Yeah, Tyler, I think you know most people know where I stand on this. I, I I think it's more talent. You know, the Colts have invested a whole lot in that defense when you look at it. You know, Buckner is an absurd investment. Now, I shouldn't say absurd, really. I, it's it's a big investment. Um, clearly, he's given you great great play. But it is still a, an extreme investment for a defensive tackle. You know, Autry got good money. Houston got good money. And think about the high draft picks. I mean, Leonard second round, Okariki third round, Yassin second round, early second round. We're talking with these guys. Even going back to Quincy Wilson, Malik Hooker, uh, Terrell Basham, his first three picks were all defensive. Julian Blackman was high. Kari Willis was somewhat high. So they've invested a lot in this rebuild. Um, I, I, I don't think it's as much schematic as it is talent to be frank but we'll see how all that plays out i know Eberflus, the um i know the texans are are, are somewhat interested I, I i don't want to get much more into that than 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 that but i know he is a name at least somewhat on their radar that's it for twitter questions all right man um yeah sorry for the chaos there that's twitter, all right twitter questions you never know what you're going to get. Uh, before we wrap up here, I do want to um, first thoughts and prayers to Rigoberto Sanchez. This broke mid-podcast. Mark and I were recording this earlier, so we paused it and just took a brief read of it. So don't have a lot of information here, but um, his statement says that uh, doctors have caught a cancerous tumor that he's going to have surgery on Tuesday before it spreads all over his body. Um I don't think there's anything listed about how much time he might miss, unless you saw something, Mark. I, I didn't see anything there. I did not. But um, some of this, I guess, we maybe saw on Sunday, certainly not the cancerous tumor aspect, and that's just put so much into perspective here in 2020 as you know, we're, we're, we're dealing with you know the craziest year, certainly in my lifetime. But um, 
Sanchez was not kicking off on Sunday, and it kind of caught us in the media contingent. And I think Mike Chappell asked Frank Reich afterwards, and he mentioned that he has a physical ailment that he is dealing with. He wasn't on the injury report, Rigo, so um, this now makes much more sense of why he wouldn't have been there. But yet, this is something that they feel like um, needs to be addressed ASAP, which you totally understand. So, um, you know, I guess maybe we'll be on punter watch. The Colts don't have a punter or kicker. Uh, Matt Gay, who was their kicker, was signed, I think, by the Rams. I think he's now kicking for the Rams, I want to say. Um, but, yeah, thoughts and, and prayers to Rigo. I don't know him very, very well, but seems like an extremely nice guy. From the conversations I have, I know he's well-liked in that locker room. Chris Baller gave him a deserved contract extension. You guys know how I feel about him as a player. I think he's absolutely tremendous and has been a great weapon for this football team this season. So um, it is a loss there in the punting department. Uh, so, yeah, we'll have more of that on Wednesday's podcast. Thanks, Mark. No problem. I appreciate Pleasure it. Pleasure to be man. here. It was a joy. Yeah, it was um, Mark produces our morning show for those that don't listen to 107.5 The Fan on a weekly basis and does an outstanding, outstanding job. Um, everybody have a great week, and uh, I'll be back uh, Wednesday afternoon recording a little bit of a Texans preview for week 13 in the NFL.